皆さんこんにちは。日本の皆さんおはようございます。本日はテトロオハイオ州ウェビナーにご参加をいただきましてありがとうございます。本日司会を務めますテトロシカゴ事務所橋本と申します。どうぞよろしくお願いいたします。冒頭ぜひシステムについて紹介をさせていただければと思います。本日は、Zoom、のプラットフォームを利用しています。まず通訳ご用意しておりますので英語のプレゼンテーションの際通訳ご利用の方は地球儀マークのボタンから日本語を選択してくださいメインセッションの時に司会後も英語に切り替えますのでご利用の際にはそちらでお願いいたしますスマートフォンにも通訳機能ございますのでぜひ設定の中から探していただければと思います本日通訳は英語から日本語への一方通行になります。本日、オハイオ州テーマに州政府経済開発公社ジョブスオハイオとの共催で進めてまいります。冒頭、シカゴ事務所から簡単にオハイオ州,オハイオ州について紹介をさせていただければと思います。まず、エジェトロシカゴ事務所長、ラフ・ウィンポンズ・ザートよりご挨拶を兼ねてオハイオについてお話しいたします。おはようございます、皆さん。あの私はジェットシカゴのラフィ・プレザダです。We warmly welcome Japan. That was the first words that Ohio Governor Mike DeWine said to me when I first met him in February of 2018. The very top leadership of the state of Ohio supports Japan. He supports Japanese companies and he supports Japanese families living in Ohio. It's very good and it's quite remarkable to see this type of deep commitment to Japan. You see, Governor, Devon, Governor DeWine, he even wants you to come to his home in Columbus, Ohio. He and his team want you to be comfortable and he wants you to enjoy. A friendly relationship with you. Look, even his wife, First Lady Fran DeWine, wants to know you. They want to meet you. They want to have you enjoy your lives in Ohio. And what impressed me was that Governor DeWine will travel to Japan when it is safe to visit your headquarters. Here, here, here he is speaking at Jetro Tokyo in 2019. So, why am I explaining this to you? Why is it important for you to know this? Because if the top leadership in Ohio supports Japan, this is a reflection of how the entire state feels about Japanese. We warmly welcome Japan to Ohio. When you are ready, please join me and let's meet Governor DeWine and his team together. I know that you're very busy and it's the end of the fiscal year. So I'm very grateful that you could spend your morning with us today. And I welcome you to our program. Thank you very much. ありがとうございます。ぜひ私からもおはようの概要をご説明させていただければと思います。画面ご覧ください。まず州の基礎情報です。おはよう州、州の面積10万平方キロメートル。これは本州の約半分程度の広さになります。人口1200万人弱ですので、これは東京都の人口とほぼ同じです。ですのでイメージとして東京都の人口が広い本州半分に広がっているようなイメージです。失業率、この数字はコロナ禍前ですけれども、現在、最新の数字でも 5.5% 程度です。一時期の早い、高い失業率は落ち着いてきています。一方で、補助金の影響もあり、職場に復帰しない労働者も多いことから、創業されている日系企業の皆さんには、労働者の確保を課題に挙げる方が非常に多いです。オハイオの地図ですけれども、オハイオの特徴の一つは、3つの大きな都市、3C と言われるシンシナティ、コロンバス、クリーブランドです。200万の都市が州の中にあり
その大都市圏、郊外、農村地帯、でこの都市の構成を持ってですね、全米の中でもアメリカの縮図と言われている、そのゆえんの一つです。で産業の多様性もオハイオ州の魅力です。もともとの製造業の中心地だったトリド、ここの I75 という週間道路を取ってますけれども、この周りに製造業、たくさん集積をしています。その中でも、あのデイトのエリアは空軍関連の研究施設も多く、産業機械の集積もシンシナティに向けて見られます。クリーブランド、現在、今、知事の中でも重点項目の一つですけれども、投資計画、発表されています。クリーブランドクリニック大病院ですけれども、もともとデジタル医療の集積地ですので、こちらのエリアに 5.6 億ドルの新規投資を発表しまして、医療関係のクラスター、イノベーションのエコシステム形成に注力されています。その他、アクロンといえばゴム、科学の中心地、コロンバスの中には金融の金融関係とかなど集積が見られ、こう産業の多様性、これもオハイオ州の魅力です。日本のメディアではオハイオというのはです、ね、ネガティブな印象を持つ方もいるかもしれませんがもちろん一区画過疎,過,疎過疎が進む地域もありますけれどもそれを上回る成長新しい産業の構成が見られますのでぜひ幅広くオハイオを知っていただきたいと思いますその中でも本日のテーマは EV 関連それと再生可能エネルギーの現状をアップデートいただきますのでそのオハイオ市の中心であるこの製造業や関連する再生エネルギーの現状について知っていただければと思います。実はジェトロ、コーディネーターをおはようにおいております、花代と申しますが、彼女も今回参加していますので、簡単に現状、特にあのワクチンの接種の状況などからアップデートをいただきたいと思います。花代さん、あのお願いします。おはよう州コーディネーターの花代です。現在、おはよう州のコロナワクチン接種状況ですけれども、40歳以上が対象になっておりますそして来週からは16歳以上が対象ということで昨日の時点では接種者が 25% そして2回すでに接種されている方は 14.26% まで来ていますまずはじめに、えー、次のスライドお願いします日本企業向けセレクト USA 直後のミッション米国の最新投資環境に興味のある日本企業が日本日米から参加し大学発のスタートアップ新,教新興企業と連携する日系企業インキュベーション施設を訪問しましたジェトロでは引き続きビジネス視察ミッションそして日本の企業の皆様にご紹介する業務を続けていきますオハイオ州市長と日本スペシャルニュースデータこれは昨年の12月に発行されましたが各地のローカルな情報を新出品の日本企業のためにご紹介しております後ほど資料をお送りしますのでリンクからご覧になっていただければ幸いですそしてこれがサンプルなんですけれども指導認知ということで市長からのメッセージ市のプロファイルそれに追加して日本企業との関係について今回参加していただいた、えー、市長の皆さんです。この笑顔からもお分かりかと思いますけれども、皆さん非常に親日家で素朴です。日本企業に感謝、そしてこれからも日本企業との関係強化を続けていきたいとおっしゃってくださっています。そしてもちろん日本人への,あの支援も積極的に行ってくださっています。で私、えー、2年間お仕事をしてきましたけれども、この度おはよう離れることになりました。今月いっぱいで輸入となります。4月からの購入は堀直江というものがありますので、ちょっと紹介させていただきたいと思います。これからも引き続きジェトロはおはようにもおりますので、よろしくお願いします。ありがとうございました。堀さん、ぜひ一言だけ。えー、皆様はじめまして堀直江と申します、えー、この度花城さんの後任としてグラスルーツアウトリッチコーディネーターの業務を担当することになりました、えー、オハイオには約13年間住んでおります、えー、どうぞよろしくお願い申し上げますありがとうございます、えー、続きまして本日はデトロイト総領事館より中川総領事にご臨席賜っております
。中川総領事、ぜひ一言ご挨拶をいただければと思います。どうぞよろしくお願いいたします。はい、えー、皆さん、はじめまして、えー、オハイオ州を管轄しております、総領事の中川あと申します。あの皆様におかれましては、まあ、コロナで、えー、まだまだ厳しい状況が続いておられることとお察し申し上げます。まあ、そうした中におきましてもです、ね、今回、オハイオ州ジョブズ・オハイオとです、ねえー、ジェトロシカゴの皆様によってです、ねまあ、オハイオ州の投資環境のアップデートと,ということで、まあ、セミナーが開かれるということは非常に嬉しいことです。えー、関係者の皆様に対して改めて御礼申し上げたいと思います。まああの今回のセミナーの中でですね、えー、ビジネスという観点からはいろいろご説明があるんだろうと思います。まあ、私からはあのむしろ在留邦人、日本人コミュニティとそういった視点からのおはいをですね一言紹介させていただければというふうに思っています。まあ、一言で申し上げればおはいを非常に、えー、住みいい地域だというふうに思っています。まあ、医療教育、治安、まあ、全ての面でですね、整備され、まあ、安心して住める地域だろうと思います。実際、オハイオ州には、まあ、ざっと申し上げて500社、日系企業500社、在留邦人1万5000人弱の方が住んでおられます。私の事務所がありますミシガン州側、隣のミシガン州もですね、大体500社。まあ、1万5千人ぐらい住んでおってですね、まあ、2つ合わせて、まあ、1000社3万人弱という規模の日本人のコミュニティが存在すると、まあ、このコミュニティというのは実はアメリカの中ではですねニューヨークロサンゼルスサンフランシスコシカゴ、まあ、そういった大都市に続く規模の日本,人日本コミュニティの集積地域であるということでございます、まあ、医療について申し上げれば先ほども出ましたけれども、クリーブランドホスピタルをはじめ、先端医療からですね、日本語で受診可能な施設がですね、各地で揃っております。先,週先々週と私も3回ほどオハイオの各地を回ってきましたけれども、実はまあ気候も良くなってきたということもあるんですが、非常に雰囲気が明るくなってきたという感じがします。花城さんからも説明がありましたけれども、ワクチンの接種がですね、まあ、隣のミシガン州よりもまあ早いペースで進んでいると、コーヒーショップなんかを行くと、お年寄りの方々がですね、まあ、楽しそうにもコーヒー飲みながら観覧していると、そういった雰囲気になりつつあります。まあ、教育面ではですね、もちろん皆さん、あの地元の公立の小中学校にお子様を通わせておられるんですけれども、まあ、コロンバス、シンシナチ、クリーブランド、さらにはトレード、トロイといった地域にですね、まあ、日本の補修校が置かれております。まあ、そこで多くの日本人の指定がですね、学んでおられるということです。まあ、さらに申し上げると、もっと身近な話題では、まあ、日本食材、日本レストランもですね、私はミシガンに住んでるんですけれども、まあ、ミシガンから見てもですねオハイオの方が非常にこう充実しているなと、まあ、いつもミシガンにオハイオに行くといろんなものを買って帰ってくるとそういったところでございます、まあ、本日のセミナーのテーマは電気自動車再生可能エネルギーということかと思います、まあ、総領事の立場から申し上げると、まあ、そうした大きな技術革新の中で今後オハイオの地位がですね、北米の中でのオハイオの地位がどういうふうに変わっていくんだろうかというのは非常に気になるところでございます。ところが、あの実は先週、オハイオのある大手の日系メーカーの方、幹部の方から伺った話で,です,ですが、まあ、そういった質問をしましたところ、その方が申し上げるにはですね、あの電気自動車、まあ、そういった大きな流れの中でですね、研究開発の拠点、まあ、製造・生産の拠点と、そういった意味でのオハイオというのは、今後はさらに一層、北米の中で重要性を増していく,といくことになるだろうと、まあ、そういうお話をされていました。まあ、本日のセミナーを通じて、ですねぜひ皆様ご自身としても、ですね北米の中でのオハイオの重要性と。そういったものを確認し、改めて確認し、それで今後の皆様の事業展開
、えー、新規投資、事業拡大と、そうした際の参考にしていただければというふうに思っております。まあ、最後になりますが、あのまあ、非常に私事ではあるんですけれども、まあ、話のさんと同じように、実は私も来月、3年弱の任期を終えまして、日本に帰任することになりました。あ最後の1年はあコロナで厳しい時期ではございましたけれども、もう非常にあの楽しい2年間、3年間を過ごさせていただいたというふうに思っております。というのも、まさにおはようの方々、皆さん非常に優しいですし、親切に接してくれたと、それから日本とおはようの関係というのも非常に良好だということによるものだろうと思います。まあ、今後、日本に帰ってですね、立場は変わると思いますけれども、しばらくは私自身、日本で勤務となりますので、ぜひ日本とおはようの発展のためにですね、何かできることがあれば、何でも協力させていただきたいと思っております。ご連絡いただければと思います。えー、これをもちまして私の挨拶とさせていただければと思います。どうも橋本さんありがとうございます。ございます。中川総理じゃあ,ありがとうございました。えー、最後にあの本ウェ,ウェビナー開催にあたりおはよう周知市からも本ウェビナーの成功と日本の皆様への歓迎のメッセージをいただいていますことを申し上げます。それではこれからメインセッションに参ります。本日使用する講演資料につきましては、事前のリマインダーメールに URL をつけておりますので、ぜひご参照ください。日本語の訳もつけております。ご質問はぜひ Q&A の質問の欄から直接入力をいただきますようお願いいたします。日本語でも英語でも問題ございません。それでは、ここからは英語で進行させていただきます。本セミナーが皆様のお役に立てれば幸いです。Then I'd like to begin the main session. So, distinguished speakers, we are very grateful to have you. Thank you very much for joining us today. So, first of all, I'd like to share the recorded message from JP Nasif, president and CIO of Jobs Ohio. So, it is an honor to have his message as a leadership of Jobs Ohio. Thank you, Jetro, Governor DeWine, Consul General Nakagawa, and Ralph Inferzato for your remarks. The last time we were together was in September of 2019 during our investment mission to Japan. Our theme was the Ohio Japan investment dynamic, and Chairman Sasaki graciously welcomed us. It's hard to imagine that our subsequent meeting would be virtual. In 2019, we also celebrated the 40th anniversary of Honda's arrival to Ohio. Honda now employs over 16,000 people. Honda came to Ohio because of available land, solid infrastructure, and people that have a solid work ethic. These very same reasons still hold true today. Today, Japanese owned companies employ over 73,000 Ohioans, the third largest number of people behind California and Texas. Over 13,000 Japanese call Ohio home. During our conversation with Honorable Consul General Nakagawa san, he let us know that Japanese companies are facing issues with work visas, finding labor, and logistics issues getting goods into the U.S. and to Ohio. While many of these challenges exist across the U.S., Jobs Ohio will do our part to assist Japanese companies with these issues. Governor DeWine spoke about the importance of the electric vehicle battery supply chain and some of the exciting opportunities that exist here in Ohio. We hope that you will engage with our team to learn more about why Ohio makes sense for your company. Given the governor's strong leadership, we continue to gain momentum in the business community. And Ohio is investing for the future. And in the past year, we announced three new innovation districts in our state. Companies from overseas as well as the U.S. coasts are now looking at Ohio as a potential destination to grow their businesses. We hope you will do the same. Thank you, and we look forward to meeting you in Japan or Ohio very soon. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much, Mr. Nasif, again. Thank you. So, next up. Please allow me to introduce Justin Kocher, Director of International Business Development, Jobs Ohio. 
So he's a champion for Japanese companies in Ohio and really kind and know how to communicate with Japanese companies. It's really fortunate to have you today. Justin, so please. Thank you very much for those kind words. Um, it was great to hear from the Consul General um, as well as the JETRO team. Um, as our President Nassif mentioned, you know, the, the story with Japan and Ohio began over 40 years ago with Honda and has grown really tremendously um, over the course of the past 40 years. And it's something we're proud of and it's something we'd like to continue to grow. I'd like to play a little video for, for you from the last time we were in Japan with Governor DeWine. So good morning to all of you in Japan and thank you for joining today's webinar. I'd like to share a little bit with you about our organization. Um, we are a private nonprofit corporate corporation. We represent the, govern the government of Ohio. And our purpose is to help businesses have a soft landing here in the state. Um, our, our mission is to drive job creation and capital investment in the state of Ohio and to be the best in the country doing so. And we also choose to act with uh, values that uh, embrace integrity and value people. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Ohio, um, a lot of people are surprised to learn that we are the seventh largest economy in the United States, um, which represents the 21st largest economy globally. Um, one of the things that people are also surprised to learn is that we have a large stable budget reserve. And the reason why I like to share that point is because that means with that sort of clarity from a budgetary perspective, it means you can be assured that the tax regime here will also be stable. We've worked hard since we were founded over 10 years ago um, to really embrace business and improve our, our rankings with various uh, organizations. And I'm happy to say that we've now improved our rankings into the top 10 in various different uh, indices that represent the ease of doing business. Ohio is also proud to call uh, over 54 Fortune 1000 companies home. And the interesting thing about Ohio is that it does have um, a broad representation of different uh, sectors and industries throughout the state. We are known uh, as, a, as a manufacturing state, but many people are surprised to learn that we are, are very well known also for, for healthcare and for finance and insurance, uh, as well as retail. One of the reasons so many Fortune 500 and Fortune 1000 companies call Ohio home is because, again, we have a favorable tax regime and a favorable business environment. And that means that our pro-business state has a tax climate that has no corporate or profits or income tax, no personal property tax or inventory tax, no tax on products sold outside of Ohio, or no taxes on machinery and equipment or R&D. We have a, a very low uh, CAT tax, which is applied to sales outside of uh, Ohio. I'm sorry, no product, no tax on, on sales within the state of Ohio. There is only a small commercial activities tax on 0.26% uh, of your sales. Another thing that people um, may not be aware of is just how easy it is to get from Ohio to the, 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 ma the majority of the population base of North America. You can reach 60% of the population within a one day's truck drive and uh, a two hour flight as well. Um, we have a very robust infrastructure system throughout the state. Um, we have one of the highest number of uh, intermodals for freight. Um, we have connections via river and lakes as well. 
Um, and again, the, the, the low cost environment allows you to access such a broad populace um, at a lower price point for your company. Ohio's workers, every, every company we, we speak with has um, questions around the ability to find uh, workforce and to find talent. And we are, we're blessed with a, a large uh, economy. We have the third largest uh, workforce in the United States with over five and a half million workers. But these workers also are, are well-educated with over 200 uh, institutions of higher education throughout the state. And one of the things that we have really, I think, improved upon uh, in the course of, of the 10 years that Jobs Ohio has been um, in business is the ability to find the right workers for companies through our talent acquisition services program, which I'll share a little bit more about uh, later on. One thing that Japanese companies, I think, um, also are interested to learn is that from, from a climatological perspective, Ohio is, is very safe. We are, are fortunate to avoid a lot of the uh, earthquakes and tornadoes that um, tend to pop up throughout the United States. It's a very stable place to locate your business. Now I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the services that we offer as uh, Jobs Ohio. So again, as I mentioned before, we're, we're here to help your company um, get established here in Ohio. And we're here to be a one-stop shop to help with everything from finding a building or a site for your company to um, managing the incentive application process with you, helping with workforce recruitment to find the workers that you'll need, helping with permits, uh, introducing you to various um, accounting firms or immigration firms for visa questions. And one of the things that I think I'm most proud of about Jobs Ohio is while many uh, economic development organizations will offer very similar types of services to help companies get established in their state, Jobs Ohio has the resources to be here as you continue to grow. We, we don't intend to have you come to Ohio and then we don't engage with you. In fact, we try to reach out to your company on an annual basis to see how your business is going and to understand some of the challenges and opportunities that you're facing and to see if there's anything that we can do as an organization to assist you. Some of the programs that we help with, um, there are essentially two different types of incentive programs that are either uh, different types of grants, which is um, cash, money, or there are loans um, that we can, you tell us sort of what your primary interest is. Um, is it acquiring workforce? Is it help assistance with uh, machinery and, and equipment financing? Um, and we will basically tailor a program to help you as best we can. Um, we will also manage uh, some of the other programs that are offered through the state, including a job creation tax credit um, or monies for road work development, development if you're going to create a, a large facility that needs infrastructure around that. We're here to assist with all of those questions. And while Jobs Ohio is the state level entity, we do work with six different regional partners that essentially function as an extension of our team. We have people uh, throughout, the, throughout the state of Ohio to help you with your business needs. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the Japanese investment in Ohio. As we can see here, uh, Japanese investment does represent uh, the majority of investment throughout the state. Uh, as you heard uh, JP Nassif reference, there are over 73,000 people here in Ohio uh, employed by Japanese companies, uh, a number that we're very proud of. And um, the fact that uh, we have helped over 100 projects with Japanese uh, owned companies since Jobs Ohio was founded. Here are just some of the uh, emblems of some of the major corporations that we've worked with. 
um, here at Jobs Ohio, many of which you'll, you'll be familiar with. Um, I just wanted to give uh, an, an understanding that while uh, we do have a large focus on the automotive sector, we do help companies throughout various other sectors as well. This slide, uh, while it might be a little bit uh, difficult to read, I wanted to just share where the population of Japanese uh, are located throughout the state and where the population of Japanese companies are located. So I think that the theme that you'll notice here is that uh, the uh, Columbus, Central Ohio and Southern Ohio, Cincinnati, uh, tend to be the predominant areas where most of the companies and people are but that also extends westward uh, to the Dayton area. And there are still people, um, there are still a fair amount of Japanese and people and businesses in Northern Ohio in uh, the Cleveland and Toledo areas as well. I would like to just share one quick um, case study of a Japanese company that we did a project with. Actually, um, we announced this during the governor's investment mission. Um, in 2019. Um, I, I think this story is, is particularly interesting to me, uh, the Topre Corporation, because it, it touches on a number of points that um, I think are very, very salient and interesting. Uh, because Springfield, Ohio, uh, near the Dayton area, there was a large uh, bus manufacturing plant that um, had gone out of business. And the site um, needed some environmental remediation work and it needed some cleanup work. And um, so it was an area in need of, of some investment and um, some growth. And um, the senior vice president of Topre America, you know, even commented that the, the whole situation resonated with his group. Uh, and they noticed, hey, we should, we should go in and revitalize that site. Well, they were able to do so and were so successful here in Ohio that they grew not only uh, one time um, from a small 20 plant um, operation, they grew subsequently two more times and um, we're very proud of their success. And the result of this is that they, uh, were, this is what one of our marquee projects for the state of Ohio. Just quickly, I wanted to introduce the rest of the team here we have uh, Amy Lay and myself here in Ohio, but we also have people in uh, Tokyo to assist you. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, following the rest of the presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Justin, for providing a holistic overview of Ohio. Thank you. So then I'd like to move on to today's main topic. So first EV. So we are very fortunate to have a special person today. I'd like to introduce Mr. Jonathan Bridges. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, Managing Director at Automotive Sector Jobs Ohio. So he's really expert. So prior to joining Ohio, Jobs Ohio, Jonathan works at Dana Corp's world headquarters in Mumi, Ohio uh, for several years. In addition, Jonathan spent more than 15 years within Chrysler Corp engaging in a number of functional areas and assignments. He served as a quantitative economist for the Chrysler Group and as the manager of NAFTA economics for Daimler Chrysler. So in, for Jetro, we are having, getting a lot of inquiries about EV situation in the United States. So I'm very excited to hear, uh, hear your update uh, EV situation in Ohio as well, along with the overview of auto supply chain in Ohio. So Jonathan, please. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to share our Ohio story. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Please let me know that you can see it. Yes. Yes. Yes, I guess, could you make this uh, full screen more? Oh, yes, perfect, thank you. Okay. Thank you. 
So as Justin introduced earlier, Ohio is a very large state and particularly large when it relates to the automotive industry. The state of Ohio has approximately 670 automotive establishments ranging from your large OEM facility or original equipment manufacturers, which we would uh, classify as your Honda, GM, or Ford, as well as your tier one or tier two suppliers into the industry. And that's just one aspect. What makes Ohio extremely strong, and which I will share later, is its proximity to the overall automotive ecosystem within North America. Currently, Ohio is the number one producer of engines and the number two producer of transmissions in the US. And that has been particularly favorable in assisting the industry, not only from an Ohio standpoint, but in the Midwest. But as we will see in the future, that is going to transition from an internal combustion engine or ICE propulsion into an electric vehicle or hybrid propulsion technology, which will be the future of our industry as we see it. Ohio has been blessed with many investments and we currently have six different original equipment manufacturers in Ohio, of which Honda has three different assembly plants, but we also have additional automotive OEM investments from Ford and two from Stellantis, formerly FCA or Chrysler, as well as two additional commercial vehicle plants and our iconic recreational vehicle Airstream. So what has benefited Ohio the most is essentially our proximity in the automotive space. Ohio is centrally located, which I'll show a map later, in the overall Ohio in the overall automotive ecosystem. And that has benefited companies that choose to locate into Ohio to be a one operation, to set up one operation and then have the availability to supply multiple customers from a central location within the US. As Justin mentioned earlier, we have a very strong and able and skilled workforce to meet the needs of every employer, whether they need a four-year degreed engineer or two years or even someone who's just very technically capable of providing different work aspects. In this section here, I'd like to highlight the R&D and innovation resources that we have in Ohio. There will be subsequent materials that will follow as part of this webinar where there are, there's more detailed information that is translated for you. But to highlight something specific here on the slide is particularly our Transportation Research Center, which is a very large, the largest North American independent proving ground in the US. And the Smart, Smart Mobility Advanced Research and Test Center, uh, with the acronym SMART that allows for autonomous and connected vehicle uh, uh, testing, which is also located at the Transportation Research Center. Lastly, on the Transportation Research Center, I'd like to highlight the Vehicle Research and Test Center, which is the home of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA's test facility. All of these are located in our central Ohio region, as well as our US 33 Smart Mobility Corridor which provides for testing, not only in a closed loop environment on the Transportation Research Center site, but then exiting that facility and getting out on to US Route 33, you have open road testing that is available to any company that's looking to do live testing in a real world environment. And all of that is, is benefited because of the Ohio State University, which happens to house part of their research labs at the Transportation Research Center and actually is the functioning manager from a board standpoint of the, of the Transportation Research Center. So to highlight again where Ohio sits within the North American market, what you have here highlighted are 
different automotive assembly facilities. These are all colored and highlighted here. The large radius provides for a one day's drive, approximately 600 miles or a thousand kilometers where you can access 96% of the US and Canadian automotive assembly production. And as many of you know that are familiar with the automotive industry, where you have an assembly plant, you ha typically have a tier one that's within a very short distance because of just in time and just in sequence requirements. And then subsequently you have a very close tier two or tier three supplier that are also very close to your tier one because of the supply chain aspects. So again, you know, Ohio is centrally located between the majority of the automotive assembly plants in North America. To get more specific about some of the investments that are here in Ohio, you'll notice that they are highlighted and colored, but they also here show the concentration of automotive employment. The darker the blue indicates the higher concentration of automotive employment and the lighter blue, the lower. What you will see focused here is that there is a large concentration in our Northwest Ohio and Central Ohio regions. And there are specific automotive OEMs that have multiple operations within our state. So not only, for instance, does Honda have three assembly plants, but they have seven other facilities located within Ohio to support their operations. And that is just for Honda. Again, you will notice that there are multiple OEMs that have many establishments. One I'd like to highlight that is a newer investment here in red is our General Motors Lordstown facility that was recently purchased and has launched a brand new OEM called Lordstown Motors, which is a brand new electric vehicle pickup truck manufacturer. But then adjacent to that facility is a brand new battery facility that is a joint partnership between General Motors and LG Chem. They are both located simultaneously in this region of our state. Again, uh, this slide was shared with Justin, but to highlight, these are some of the, what we call projects that have been um, brought to success here in Ohio. More specifically, I'd like to highlight some of the other automotive establishments where there are, the majority are Japanese employment. You will notice the large concentration again in our central Ohio region, as well as our, in our Dayton and Cincinnati regions, our Cleveland region, and our Toledo region. Again, these are just a few of the companies that of Japanese companies that have made investments in Ohio. Additionally, because of our strong relationship, many of our cities have sister and friendship relationships with many Japanese cities. Again, Ohio is not only strong in the automotive assembly space, but we support many aspects of the industry. Here highlighted are the major components of an automobile, of which you will see many companies that you may recognize that have establishments within Ohio in multiple companies. Again, this is just to highlight familiarity of companies that have made the investment in Ohio that you may recognize and that are not only in the automotive assembly space, but in many other components of the automotive. As I mentioned earlier, we are seeing a transition, a transition from the internal combustion engine to the electric vehicle. There have been many investments that have already been made in Ohio to support what 
what we consider the traditional part of our industry, but many of the OEMs have already made public their desire to increase investment in the electric vehicle supply chain. Because of our longstanding relationships with many of these OEMs and large tier ones, we have already begun discussions to support their growth in the electric vehicle supply chain. To highlight here, you will notice that these are some of the public statements that have been made by many of the OEMs already to support the growth of the EV supply chain in, in, from a global standpoint. And we anticipate, although we cannot make public, our discussions with many of these companies to support growth of EVs in Ohio currently. To highlight more familiarity of how the US is transitioning, here in red, you'll see Ohio and some of the vehicles that are produced that are either hybrid electric or full on electric vehicles. And we have a battery facility that is coming online soon. And highlighted here are other states that are again making, uh, providing electric vehicles into the North American market. What you'll also notice is, again, the major automotive states and Ohio's proximity to those states where a company can set up an operation and supply any of these OEMs for future. I know Justin touched on this very briefly, as will I, about the workforce and talent that is available through our academic institutions. Ohio is the second largest automotive, has the second largest automotive workforce, and we have 54 Ohio technical training centers. But again, those facilities are spread throughout the state and provide easy access for companies to gain employees. And we at Jobs Ohio are happy to make introductions to those academic institutions as companies are looking for employees in the future. What is very, what is very, what is not very common is that the Ohio State University being our flagship university in Ohio has a center devoted to automotive research. As many institutions are starting to add centers for automotive research, Ohio State, the Ohio State University has had a research center for a number of years and is a leader in the engineering of the industry. And their expertise has grown such that they work on powertrain, electrification, autonomous and connected vehicles, and safety and security with their PhD research staff and professors as well as graduate students. Oftentimes, other companies partner or fund research to be done by the Ohio State University Center for Automotive Research because they are such a leader in the industry. Lastly, I'd like to highlight one specific example of how Ohio has been able to provide the opportunity for partnerships and development. We have in our central Ohio region, a city by the name of Marysville. It is the home of Honda's manufacturing assembly plant or one of Honda's assembly manufacturing facilities. This particular city partnered with Honda to create an environment where their entire city worked to provide a testing environment for vehicle to infrastructure communication. Not only did the city work with Honda to provide that partnership, but the state of Ohio and Jobs Ohio provided opportunities for connectivity and investment 
into this area of our state to support the growth. Again, since this is in our central Ohio region, they were also able to take advantage of our 33 smart mobility corridor, as I mentioned earlier, as well as they already have existing relationships with our transportation research center. So the road to smart mobility starts in Ohio with research, test and deployment. And I'd like to thank you for this opportunity. There will be additional information that will be provided by the JETRO team. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for your comprehensive presentation about O2O supply chain in Ohio, and the EV trend as well. So I'm looking forward to hearing your perspectives in the QA session. Thank you. So next, uh, I'd like to introduce another special speaker, Mr. Dan Somila, Ohio Energy Policy Director, Natural Resource Defense Council. So as NLDC's Director of Energy Policy in Ohio, so he works with a wide range of energy industry stakeholders to advocate for clean energy and climate policies before the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio and the General Assembly. So he's the best person to speak about, talk about the status and the trends of renewable energy in Ohio. So thank you very much for joining us today, Dan San. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And good morning to our audience in Japan. Uh, I was having trouble finding my unmute button there, but we've, we got it. Yeah. Um, so I just want to start. Uh, so my name is Dan Saul Miller. I'm the Ohio Energy Policy Director at, here at NRDC. Uh, I've lived in Ohio my whole life. I'm a very proud Ohioan. I grew up in a small town in Northwest Ohio called St. Mary's. It's a sister city to Awaji City in Japan. And I remember uh, in in middle school, um, visiting with folks from Awaji City and planting a tree at the school uh, was some of my first introduction to uh, Japan. And in our in our town, the uh, AAP is a major, major employer, uh, subsidiary company of Hitachi Metals, now Kosei. And uh, it employs a lot of my friends where I grew up. And, and these are people who just want to go to work and work hard. And you've provided that opportunity uh, or, or you know, through this relationship, uh, that opportunity has been provided. So I just wanted to offer a, a word of thanks for that and just say how proud I am to be here uh, to give back by helping understand renewable energy in Ohio and Ohio's power sector. So the Natural Resources Defense Council is an international nonprofit environmental organization with more than 3 million members and activists uh, all across the world. Well, we've been active since 1970 with our lawyers, scientists, and other environmental specialists working on policies to protect the world's natural resources, public health, and the environment. We have offices in New York City, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Bozeman, Montana, and Beijing. Today, what I'd like to talk with you about is renewable energy in Ohio. We'll talk about the supply, the availability of renewable energy in Ohio and in the future, the drivers of the clean energy growth that we're seeing in our state. And then we'll talk a little bit about, at a high level, some of the purchasing strategies that are available to you to buy into the renewable energy that we're seeing developed in Ohio. And I'll offer some resources for follow-up to uh, allow you to dig a little bit deeper. So let's start with renewable energy supply in Ohio. The first thing I want to touch on is the significant amount of emission reductions we've seen in Ohio since 2005. Ohio is a top 10 state in the United States for emission reduction since that time. Uh, you can see in my slides here that in 2019, Ohio's power sector emissions were 49% below where they were in 2005. The yellow bar you see on the right is the national average. So the national average is a 32% emission reduction since 2005. So you can see here that Ohio is, is uh, very much outpacing the rest of the United States in terms of addressing our emissions. 
the, the primary cause of this has been coal retirements. Ohio has traditionally been a very coal heavy uh, dominated state in terms of energy production. But since 2010, Ohio has retired a significant number of coal plants. In fact, in Ohio, I think we've uh, scheduled uh, the retirement of more coal plants than any other state in, in the United States. Um, and th there's, of course, issues that come with that in terms of transitioning that economy. But from an emissions perspective, this is primarily what's driven uh, some of the reductions. And what this has left behind in our state is a incredibly valuable transmission infrastructure for the transmission of electricity. And that creates new capacity that allows new clean energy to come online inside Ohio and connect into that same electricity grid. So the electric grid that Ohio is a part of, you can see a picture here in the, in the bottom left corner. Uh, Ohio is connected to a 13 state power grid called PJM. And this allows electricity to flow freely among all 13 of these states. And it's got a pretty diverse mix of energy supply, similar to Ohio, which I'll show in a minute. Uh, but in 2021, we're seeing uh, what I'm showing you on the right here are the planned uh, utility scale electric generating power plants that are expected to come online this year. And what you can see in PJM is 15.4 gigawatts of solar and 12.2 gigawatts of wind expected to come online this year alone. Uh, you see some natural gas, nuclear, and some other technologies, but it just shows you that all throughout the PJM region, clean energy is starting to really take uh, the front row seat. And so what I've done here is uh, tried to boil this down a little bit to kind of show you where Ohio sits in PJM in terms of solar in particular. And so this slide shows you on the blue bar, the, the amount of solar additions that we're seeing, and then the yellow bars are hybrid solar, which is basically utility scale solar projects that are combined with battery storage technology. And uh, after the state of Virginia here in, in the, to the right, uh, you can see that Ohio is a leading state for solar development. And I expect this, um, I expect this to grow. In fact, the state of Ohio is uh, expected to be the leading Midwest state for solar development over the next five years. So you're going to see Ohio, I think, grow here and have uh, a much larger renewable energy presence than, uh, than we even have so far. So um, as I mentioned, renewable energy is playing a much greater role in Ohio's energy mix. Just like we saw in the PJM slide, the graphic on the right shows you that uh, in Ohio, we're, we've got 16 gigawatts of utility scale solar that include storage uh, planned to come online. These are projects that are in some stage of development in the state right now, whether they are already approved and advancing to construction, or if they just have an application pending with our siting board where they get a certificate to commence construction activity. But you can see here that uh, you know, Ohio has a, a strong gas presence, but solar energy is really the dominating resource today that we're seeing come online. Um, and and uh, as I had already mentioned, this is going to grow. The, the picture on the left shows you our current energy mix. So right now we're sort of split 40% coal, 40% gas, a 15% share of our portfolio comes from nuclear power plants. And then uh, we're a little less than 3% with renewables right now. But as I've tried to articulate here, this is changing very quickly. If I were to show you this slide from 10 years ago, this would show you 90% coal and no renewable energy at all to speak of. And so this is a drastic shift that's happening in Ohio right now. And as you saw on the right, uh, solar energy is the predominant resource that we're seeing come online. So this picture here gives you a graphic of where the solar energy projects are being located. Most of them hug the southwestern part of our state near the Cincinnati, Dayton, Columbus area between this, this triangle of this part of our state. But it's starting to progress more up into areas uh, of our northwest part of our state. You can see in all Glaze County where I grew up, uh, projects going in there all the way up to Defiance and clear up to the Michigan border. So. Uh, we're oftentimes challenged in Ohio. People say it's not sunny enough uh, and the winter is too long, but solar energy works in Ohio and we're seeing a lot of development. 
So let's talk about the drivers of this growth. Why so much clean energy and why so much solar in particular in Ohio? Um, going back again to PJM, one of the main drivers that we're seeing is, is demand for clean energy. There's a demand for clean energy coming from everywhere, but that includes state governments in this 13 state region. And I've listed on the right, the renewable portfolio standards that have been implemented in the different states around PJM. What's interesting though, is that in order to meet these 100% or other uh, percentage goals for renewable energy, some of these other states don't have the infrastructure, the flat land and the solar resource to cost effectively build renewable energy to meet that demand. So it's coming to Ohio where we have the flat tillable agricultural land just to the Western portion of our Appalachian region where solar energy makes a lot of sense. We have farmers on this land that are very excited about solar development. It offers new income opportunities. It's offering them ways to protect and preserve their family farms. And so there's, there's been a big embrace of utility scale solar in the state and, and uh, demand from governmental policy around the 13 state region is one of the main drivers. Another main driver is the cost. Over the last 10 years, the cost of utility scale solar has declined nearly 90% just a massive, massive shift in the cost of energy technology uh, over the last decade. And you can see here that solar PV, the, uh, the two different forms of solar photovoltaic energy production are two of the cheapest resources to develop for energy supply. Uh, and so this, this levelized cost analysis was done by Lazard. It comes out every year and renewable energy continues to tr trend cheaper and cheaper. We're seeing these projects developed in Ohio uh, at four cents a kilowatt hour or less. Uh, going back to demand, the government policy is not the only demand driver. We're seeing large energy buyers accelerate their renewable energy deals. This is a slide from the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance, which helps large energy consumers get connected to renewable energy, help you understand how to do a power purchase agreement, how to get connected to a renewable facility. And you can just see here that they're breaking records every year in terms of large corporate purchases of renewable energy. Uh, with, with the overlapping market crises of the COVID pandemic and all the things we've all struggled through the last year, renewable energy development and purchasing by large corporations has not slowed a bit. And in fact, it's increased. Uh, and, and to our topic, uh, we're seeing a similar thing with electric vehicles. Um, demand for electric vehicles is not an issue. The supply of the electric vehicles is what's slowing down things. But I wanted to talk quickly about the key motivators for corporate renewable energy purchases. The most important thing found from the RE100 group, which is uh, a group of large corporate buyers who have committed to purchasing a 100% renewable energy supply, the primary reason is the management of their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, corporate social responsibility, customer and shareholder um, demands are driving some of this, but it's also an opportunity to save money, to manage long-term risk in terms of your power costs, um, and to uh, take advantage of certain policy incentives. But this just gives you a sense of um, not only that, that large corporations are demanding renewable energy, but the reasons why. So let's, let's get into uh, renewable energy purchasing strategies briefly. First thing I wanted to mention is uh, renewable energy certificates or RECs. So a renewable energy certificate represents the environmental attribute of one megawatt hour of renewable energy. So every megawatt hour of uh, energy that would be produced from a solar facility, for example, would create a REC. Uh, these can be bought and sold separate from the power that's generated. So the developer of that project could sell their power elsewhere, but could sell to you the green attribute of that power. You would then take that wreck and retire it from the market and be able to claim the environmental attribute of that project. Um, once that wreck is retired, it cannot be resold, donated, or transferred in any way. So you can have accounting that you have indeed met your emission reduction uh, target uh, with those individual RECs. 
And uh, uh, a nice pro of this is it's easy to understand, it's easy to execute, um, and you can buy this in a volume based on how much load you're trying to offset. So it's very flexible. Uh, the con is that it has a smaller economic impact. Uh, what we're seeing more and more are corporations that want to buy renewable energy want to want their purchase of that energy to be additive. They want to have a meaningful difference in bringing a new project online. And so we're seeing a trend uh, a little bit away from simple renewable energy certificate purchases and more toward uh, power purchase agreements that can uh, be additive in terms of project development. So I want to talk briefly about that. Uh, there are both virtual and physical power purchase agreements. The most cost-effective way typically to do this or the most financially beneficial way is to do a 15, 20, 25 year uh, agreement with an off-taker or a purchaser uh, who has an investment grade rating. And this will give you the most efficient uh, financing. You can uh, structure these to where you have a fixed price for the full period of that contract, whether it's 15 to 25 years, or you can have an escalating price where it's lower in the beginning and it escalates two, three, four percent uh, over the period of the contract, typically staying below what electricity prices are expected to escalate at over time. And so there's flexibility there in terms of how you structure it, but this can give you certainty in the cost of energy to supply your facilities, in addition to helping you reduce any emission uh, reduction targets that you might have. Uh, these long-term contracts are, I think, beneficial because they can help to drive a particular project forward, like I mentioned before. Uh, these projects can get developed and they can get permitted and ready to go to construction, but oftentimes they won't be built until they have some kind of agreement for someone to, to, to buy that power. And so a power purchase agreement is a very effective way to help a project come online and help uh, drive new economic development in another part of the state where may, maybe you are or are not located, uh, but, but it drives economic value in, in the state of Ohio uh, and, and allows um, off takers to partner with those communities. And then of course, this can hedge against the rising price of, uh, of electricity, as I mentioned. And sorry, I keep uh, slipping backwards on my slides. So just to touch on a couple of other strategies that are available, didn't want to go too deep into these. I just wanted to show there's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of ability to coordinate with other purchasers, uh, with developers and others. Uh, you can, th there are ways for you to coordinate your payment for electricity through your utility, through green tariffs uh, and other options. You need to consult with your local utility in Ohio, your distribution utility to see what do they have available uh, to allow you to finance these projects through your utility bill. But there are a lot of ways to get into a renewable energy project and enjoy that, the value of that without having to outlay a big capital investment. The, the developers of these projects make that upfront investment. They take on that risk and you have the ability to enjoy the savings that it generates uh, once those projects come online. So uh, to, to better understand some of these, I wanted to mention uh, in particular one group, the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance. I shared a slide from them earlier, uh, but they can really help to demystify a lot of this, help you to understand the nuance of these different uh, purchasing strategies and can walk you through that. They really are a great resource. And so uh, just to conclude, I'll share here, there's a few groups. So the Utility Scale Solar Energy Coalition of Ohio is a newly formed uh, collaborative group in the state of about 19 different solar developers. It'd be a great place to get connected and to talk with these businesses themselves about uh, what kind of development they're doing, how you can get into a project, how you can partner with them. The Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance is another organization that can really help you understand contracting, uh, it's a place for businesses to come together, learn best practices, coordinate with one another. Uh, RE100 is a really great resource. Again, these are companies who have committed to 100% renewable energy goals. And so they're sort of really pushing the envelope in terms of some of these strategies and figuring out how to, how to make it work. And then of course, uh, we have a great, great resource here in the state in Jobs Ohio. Jonathan and his team there and JP and Justin, uh, really are a great resource for you. I would encourage you to look to Jobs Ohio as a first stop to help you get your questions answered. 
Uh, and they can, of course, help you get to me if you'd like to talk further about what I've shared. But my contact information is here for you as well. That's my email and my cell phone number. Uh, and I would be available to take a call anytime. Subasa, thank you very much. Hanson, thank you very much for your insightful and comprehensive presentation. Thank you. So many companies are thinking we have to go green or think about green, but uh, providing such a really practical guideline is really helpful. Thank you very much. So the time is limited. I'd like to take the questions from the floor. So first, I'd like to start maybe with Jonathan. Uh, hi, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you. So thank you very much for explaining uh, auto supply chain in Ohio. The question is about uh, more your perspectives about the EV trends in Ohio. So this person thinks Ohio is really wide. Is it realistic to implement EV infrastructures in Ohio? And is it realistic? much many more EVs will be uh, purchased by Ohioans. So could you provide this, uh, your comments on this? Yes, absolutely. And, and that's a great question. Um, you know, it's, it's more or less not the, um, the producer side of the EV industry, it's the consumer side of the EV industry. And consumers are demanding this as a new mode and means of transportation. So OEMs will ultimately try to meet that demand. Um, we in Ohio have you know, been engaged in traditional ICE componentry from an automotive standpoint, but we're transitioning to support what we see as the future and growth of that industry as well. And we're doing that not only um, Jobs Ohio and the NRDC, I'll, uh, not to speak for Dan, you know, we're supporting that type of activity through some partnerships we've developed but we're also looking to figure um, and, and figure out how we can support not only the EV growth, but also the infrastructure growth that is required. So absolutely, I see that as a continuing trend, not only in Ohio, but in North America. And I see that Ohio will play a key in that, in that space. Thank you very much. So the next question to the Jonathan as well. So we learned a lot of OEM EV projects is going on. So it's a really big shift. So your presentation is really affirmed these directions, but uh, have you ever heard something from local suppliers? So what's the reactions uh, of them or suppliers are trying to adapt this trend? So could you make some comments on this? Yes, absolutely. And that's very, that's very insightful of companies to be looking towards the future. Um, we have companies, again, that have been very successful in supporting the traditional industry, and they recognize as well that there is a future that is different from how they see it, uh, how, how their company may exist today. And so those companies that are looking to the future are making those transitions. In some instances, they're doing that, you know, by not only going after new contracts, but they're also looking to make investments in their operations and you know, provide an additional set of skills to their current employment workforce such that they can support that growth in the future. Um, there are many companies that are in, in that, I guess, realm of the traditional space that recognize that for them to be successful in the future, they need to balance not only the traditional industry that has made them successful, but what they see as the future um, to continue their success. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So now I got the question from the floor to uh, Adan. So uh, let me read. Ohio and PJM is also famous for the production of gas, and they are also hire lots of people as an industry. So we all know we need to think about carbon neutral, but what are your thoughts on the coexistence of renewable energy and gas-fired power? Well, I'll take this and uh, Justin, maybe you want to come in and speak uh, a little more behind me. The, uh, you know, Ohio has a, a massive gas presence, of course, when, when you saw in my presentation, the significant amount of coal retirements that we've experienced in this state, it's largely been from the proliferation of cheap natural gas 
in PJM, a lot of which comes from the Marcellus and Utica Shale development right here in the state of Ohio. So Ohio is certainly a, a gas heavy state at the moment, and we've seen a lot of growth in that area over the last uh, years. But uh, as I showed throughout PJM and throughout Ohio, it's really solar energy in particular that's growing in the PJM region. You see some wind, uh, there's less wind growth in Ohio right now, but solar is really the, the predominant source. And th the great thing about uh, our participation in PJM is we can be very, very confident that we are going to maintain a reliable uh, electricity system. They, uh, they procure reserve power in addition to what's uh, needed at any peak moment of electricity consumption. And so uh, that's a benefit that we have of being a part of this region and all the different resources that serve the grid there. Um, and so they certainly coexist, that's what we're seeing. Uh, but you know, as time goes on, we're seeing a trend toward renewable energy in this area. I don't know, Justin, if you wanna add anything to that from the gas perspective. No, I mean, I think we're, we're blessed to have both resources uh, as a state. I think few states have the ability to draw from different uh, energy sources like the state of Ohio. So we're, we're just very fortunate to have that to count on. Thank you very much. So still questions coming, but uh, now is the time's up. So I'd like to close the Q&A session, but it's really good to know who is the person in charge of this topic and you're very friendly and we can reach out to freely. So it's really a great pleasure to have you today's seminar. Thank you very much. So, yes, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. So それでは以上にて、おはようしゅうウェビナー終了いたしたいと思います。え、終了後アンケート表示されますので、ぜひ回答をお願いいたします。え、追加のご質問やジェトロへの問い合わせもあれば合わせてお願いいたします。え、本日改めてご参加いただきましてありがとうございました。それで失礼いたします。Thank you.